Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Nice to see you here this morning. Yes. Looking extra happy. I know Julian brought gold for us. Yes, yes. Um, but this morning, our first presenter is Honorable Dr. Virginia Albert Poyot, Minister for the Public Service, Labor, and Gender Relations. Right. Honorable, are you ready? Yes, good morning. good morning. And um, in fact, I want to start off by congratulating Julian Alfred for putting St. Lucia again on the world stage, having brought gold medal in her 100 meter race. And I am even more excited to know that this day was the day that we chose to have what we call the Minister's Top Performer Award. And we did have that ceremony on the 3rd of August, 2024. That was the, f the first official um, pu Minister's Public um, Top Performer Award that we put in place. And that was supposed to have been held sometime in June when we had public, public service week of activities. But we postponed it, and luck had us on the way where this happened to be the same day that we got our first gold medal at the Olympics. So we had that ceremony on Saturday evening where all ministries had to identify the top performer, top public servant in the respective ministry. And we gave away 18 awards to the the top performers, the, the top performers were identified by their respective ministries. However, we had an independent panel that examined the recommendations made from the different ministries to select the top performer overall in the public service. And that top performer was revealed on the evening of the celebration at the financial center. And the prime minister was the one who actually um, made the presentation to the top performer who came from the department, the electoral department. And this gentleman, we are hoping that at some point he will make himself um, public and he will be able to speak to the public. And we had other persons who received their awards from their respective ministries. We were graced with the presence of quite a few ministers of government and permanent secretaries that actually rewarded the top performers. Many times we hear about public service and we hear sometimes the negative things, but we do not hear the positive things that they do. And I believe that we can get people motivated, we can boost their morale by looking at the positive side and reward those who have done well. Our theme to advance the public service is basically speaking to public sector modernization, repositioning and rebranding the public service to improve service delivery. And we are working very hard at that. At this point, we are trying to see whether we can secure a common space where all government departments that deal with management of the public service in one location we, have just, uh, we are just about completing a strategic plan, an operations manual, and an implement, implementation and action plan for the public service. We are also looking at reviewing the legislation that governs the public service. And these legislations have been around for about 40 years. So you see a lot of the things that we do in the public service are based on laws that were established over 40 years ago. And I think it's time that we revisit these legislations. So this is what I want to share with the St. Lucian public, that um, we are working very hard to improve the service delivery that we have to the St. Lucians. Mm -hmm. One, Madam Minister, mm -hmm. Emancipation Day has just passed us and we heard of the implementation of the livable wage. How has that been going so far from your perspective as a Minister of Labour? Okay, I'll try to speak to the language of minimum wage. 
um, because many people will tell you the minimum wage is too small for them to live on it. So, but the, we had a, a com committee established about two years ago, the Minimum Equal and Minimum Wage um, Commission, which is mandated by the Labor Act. And after we established that committee, they went to work, and they actually looked at a lot of what happened regionally. They look at the ILO and what ILO speaks to, what we call a minimum livable wage. And they use the formula that is used by the international body. And they arrived at what we consider to be a minimum and livable wage in St. Lucia. And the Prime Minister had the pleasure of making the official announcement on Emancipation Day, 1st of August, that the minimum wage will be effective as of the 1st of October, 2024. And that speaks to $1,131. That is the minimum wage. Nobody who works for a full month should earn less than that amount when they have their take-home pay. For persons who work in areas, for example, in the hotels, where they have service charge and other commissions, that is not included in the minimum wage. It has to be added after you have um, awarded the minimum wage. So whatever commissions and service charges that comes in, it must be on top of that minimum wage. And we know some people may have issues with that, but that is what the legislation will speak to. So we have persons who work in the hotels and they get different service charges and so on. And I am not saying, yes, it was happening. I don't have the evidence to prove that. But if it was included as part of their wages, then it is no more. They have to include it after they have given them their minimum wage, and that would be on top of the, the basic wage. So there are many persons who are earning less than the minimum wage. We cannot tell you exactly the amount they were earning, but we know from now on the, the, the minimum wage must be um, awarded at a level where it was stated by the Prime Minister as of October 1st. So the different employers have the time now to make the adjustments on their books to see how we are going to um, ensure that um, persons get that minimum wage. We also want the public to understand that when we say a minimum wage, it means you have to work for the month. And don't say, well, I didn't work for all the month, but because the minimum wage is X amount, whether you work for the month or not, you have to get that minimum wage. It also carries a daily rate, which is $52 and a few cents, and then an hourly rate. So you know if you work for two weeks, you cannot expect to get the full salary of $1,131. These are things we have to educate and we have about two months to, to deal with it in the media, to explain to people how this will work out for them. But we have a few thousand people who will benefit from that. Um, are there any plans by the government to take um, any, well, any steps, measures to counter the possibility of employers actually laying off workers to, because we know that that is very possible. The Prime Minister did allude to it in his address is Emancipation Day address that he had heard whispers that some employers are planning to employers are planning to do this. So, what measures is um, is the government going to take to probably curtail that? Okay, now the Minimum Wage Commission we have actually um, renewed their term, so they will still be operating so that they monitor the implementation of the minimum wage. They will they will get the staff support and the support of the Labor Department to monitor what is happening in the, in, the, in the labor force. And we will be monitoring some employers to find out, are they laying off um, workers because of the minimum wage? And that may require government going in to find out whether it is a situation where economically they, they cannot afford it or whether they just feel well the profit level has dropped and therefore they need to release workers. And we, we will engage the employers on a one-on-one -on -one 
and government, government itself will have to find additional money to pay persons who are working for government below the minimum wage. So it's, government too is an employer. So we want the cooperation of other employers to continue to employ persons and give them a decent, a decent um, salary to go home. Because if you want your workers to perform, you want them motivated, you don't have to underpay them. Because sometimes some workers can find ways to beat the system. And therefore, we have to find what is fair. And if they know what their minimum wage is, they will, we expect them to give their employers a fair day's work for the pay that they are doing. So we have to work with the workers too. Because it's just, not just a matter of I'm getting my pay. Because we know sometimes some of the workers can be very um, not too honest in giving the employer a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. So we have to work with both sides. Mm -hmm. um, what are, what's the status of the negotiations with um, well, the different trade unions? Um, mm -hmm. I know the PWA had complained. Um, I think some of the members, they complained to the organization who would have written to the GNT um, mm -hmm. that the negotiations, the pace is too slow. So what of that? What is happening? Okay, now I can express the sentiments of the Prime Minister and likewise myself that um, we want this negotiation brought to a close. Um, it's about two years into the triennium, and if you do not um, deal with salary increase or conditions of service at, in a timely way, the employees will be disadvantaged. So the Prime Minister has asked the negotiating team to speed up the process. However, the team was waiting for some policy decisions from the Prime Minister and myself, and we have had some discussions with them. So they are clear on the direction that they have to go, especially in areas where there are a lot of um, different allowances that the employees were asking for. So we had to factor that into what that would mean for government in terms of finances. So the, the Department of Finance had to do the calculations to determine how much more money government would have to raise in order to meet the, the, the demand or the request from the trade unions. The, the, the Department of Finance has since met the negotiating team, explained the financial implications that this increase that was being requested from the trade unions, what it would mean for the government purse. So now they are getting the direction from the Prime Minister to say, we have only so much, and therefore that is what they have available to negotiate with the unions. Um, they have since gotten back in touch with the unions because I got a letter from the trade unions complaining that they find there was a, a moment of silence. They had not heard anything. And I think we are on the same page and we have asked the negotiating team to speed up the process. By what date would, um, I guess, the government would want, the central government would want this um, ended? Well, you know, Christmas is a time when a lot of people want something nice. They want to celebrate. They want to bring things to a close. And we are hoping that negotiations do not pass Christmas, that it ends before Christmas. Okay. Yeah, Madam Minister, just um, briefly, um, the aspect of overtime, you know, we have, like, say, the construction workers, we have the um, security workers. How would you be able to factor that into a payment, you know, the overtime rate? Would there be an overtime rate, or is, would it just continue as the regular rate? Or? Um, that's for, you mean because of the minimum wage, or? Yeah, because of. Um, no, to me, overtime, we don't speak to, overtime is overtime. And unless government reviews the rate for overtime in different sectors, we will not be touching that. We only see your minimum wage should be X, and therefore your overtime will be added to that. Um, we know there are many people who do earn overtime, and that overtime, there is a maximum time that you are paid overtime, and anything in excess of that time, you will not be paid in cash but you will get it in lieu of leave. So they give you some days leave to compensate you for the additional hours that you give as overtime. Okay, mm -hmm. and on a wider subject, we know um, St. Lucia just <laughs> celebrating, you know, a historic victory. As a young girl, you know, first 
female to bring that, such honor to the island. How, how much, as a minister of gender relations, how much does that reflect to young girls, not just young girls, but young people in general, you know, that's, you know, this dashing female has brought so much proud and joy to the nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I do not want to give it the slant of just a young girl, but I want to give it the slant of a young St. Lucian. Because once you start saying girl, then the boys start feeling, well, what's about us? But um, I think we have to take it one step further, where Lavon Spencer was the one that paved the way for getting at the level of the Olympics. I make no apologies for saying she's from my constituency in Babolo, and she tried her best. And I think um, Julian Alfred do make reference to her because sometimes we forget the people who actually start the process. And I'm very pleased that she has followed and taken it to a higher level, where she has brought gold for St. Lucia. And I'm hoping that she continues along that line to be a role model for young people in St. Lucia. Because many times they put um, their energy into negative activities. And here we have a young woman, uh, a young person, who has invested her time and energy in improving herself, not just on the track, but she has also improved herself academically to put St. Lucia on the map. The good thing too about it is that um, Julian did not wait until she got a gold medal to establish her foundation. And this is somebody who is willing to give back. She came to St. Lucia, she established, she launched her foundation, and then she left and she went now to get the gold. So I applaud her for that, for wanting to give back to her country for the support that she has been getting so far. I know St. Lucians are all excited, they are elated, and they were celebrating even before she got the gold. So I know they are all in slow motion in St. Lucia. We tell them, do not go in slow motion. We want all St. Lucians to remain at the speed that Julian ran so that we continue to improve St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Minister, as the, um, well, Minister for the Public Service, um, we have the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association representing the doctors who are a bit concerned. They have written to the OKEU board, and I think they're having a meeting with you all this morning. Um, with concerns about the lack of resources at the hospital, um, which is really preventing them from actually carrying out their jobs properly, and also generally, um, I guess, um, with not, deal, not, not being able to deliver proper health care to, to citizens. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on, on what's happening at OKEU. Okay, now interestingly, as you said, um, um, you, you got wind that we'll be meeting them this morning. <laughs> but um, prior to that, we had already brought uh, management of OKEU and St. Jude to a meeting with Cabinet just a few weeks ago to address the very issues that were raised by the Medical and Dental Association. So we were one step ahead in terms of addressing the matter. And the Prime Minister has made a commitment to invest a lot more in providing some of the supplies and services that they need at the hospital. So I'm very confident that coming out of the meeting today that we will see some greater improvement in the matter. When a situation has reached almost a, a crisis level, it will not change overnight. And I don't want people to believe that by tomorrow you will see a big transformation at OKEU and the way people do things. But I can give them the assurance that the government is very mindful of that. And the Prime Minister has made commitment, even the, meeting, the first meeting we had, he did commit to additional resources. So it's a matter of the process and we need to expedite the process. I actually spoke to the, the PS of health at the awards ceremony on Saturday, and I did draw something to her attention that we need to expedite the process. So I will be fully supportive of any suggestions coming from cabinet to improve the situation at OKEU. The meeting you said, the meeting was with um, the SLMDA or with the board, which meeting? No, the, the meeting was with management of um, OKEU, um, as well as St. Jude's. So we were especially dealing with the emergency department. That area we have great concern 
about the level of service that people will um, receive when they enter the emergency department. And the Prime Minister did commit additional resources to help them expedite the process. But one of the things that, um, that was raised about medical care is the, the service, the level of service and care. And this is a very soft skill. These are soft skills that people do not pay much attention to. And we felt that um, they need to do a lot more to train the, the staff. As you are aware, we have had some nurses who have left the system. They have traveled to greener pastures. Government cannot prevent them from traveling. But our responsibility is to continue to train additional persons to replace these people and then bring a new culture into the medical field where these new persons will get new training, new orientation, and so on. And I was speaking to some medical experts in Martinique, and you would have heard of my ordeal not too long ago. And what they indicated is that um, St. Lucia has more sophisticated equipment than what they have in Martinique. But our people are not trained to use the equipment. So I think that is an area we have to focus heavily on, training our people. I recall when we commissioned OKEU, I was fortunate to be part of the group that did a tour of the entire hospital before people had occupied it. And when I saw the type of equipment and everything, that was like a state of the art. But if we do not have persons who are sufficiently trained and skillful in using these equipment, then they might just be there for decoration and so on. So it is something that the government has to pay close attention to, as well as our medical practitioners. Um, we know that the nurses are living, but are you seeing the same with the doctors? Uh, is there no, a we are not seeing the same with the doctors, and we have seen a, a slowdown, a, a reduction in the rate at which the nurses were living. So uh, at least now we see more of them are staying in. Based on the trend, there is a reduction, not as many as um, how it started. Maybe I think they started off with 100 and something, and I think within the last year or few months, it's just about eight of them who have left. That's what the statistics show. Good morning, Minister. Yes. Uh -huh. um, as Sinusha struggles with the scourge of violent crime at a rate of almost two homicides a week right now, mm. could Julian Alfred be the inspiration? How, do we, how does this government turn Julian Alfred into the inspiration that draws youth away from the, that shameful life of violent crime? Mm -hmm. And could that Julian Alfred effect have an even wider effect on young entrepreneurs, academics, agriculturists, proving to them that maybe even though they don't have the best facilities and the best gear, that the little fish have always had what it takes to fry the big fish? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I believe that um, Julian Alfred's um, victory at the Olympics should serve as a form of inspiration for young people. And the government has to take advantage of that opportunity, that, that, that moment in time. And if we miss it, we may, we may be falling short. And we have to use Julian Alfred to help propel the young people, help them drive them into a different direction. And I think we have to make maximum use of her presence. I heard people talking about, yes, they need a holiday. Yes, I know our St. Lucians like a nice time. But the holiday is not going to solve our problems. What we need is to see how we can get her to be like an ambassador, to talk to young people, go around the island, and give back and share with them the sacrifices that she made to reach there. And they, too, can do better. They too can surpass her achievement. And I think that will motivate them. Government will have to put the resources to support our young people to channel their energies in that direction. Um, and if I may recall, when we had uh, um, Derek Walcott became the second Nobel Prize winner in St. Lucia, many St. Lucians may not have been aware of that. But as somebody who has been involved in education, we used to have thousands of St. Lucians going to Sir Arthur for evening classes because they were so motivated that we had the highest per capita in terms of Nobel laureates 
and therefore they started improving themselves, going for evening classes to get their, their, their diploma, their certificates and so on. I don't know if we have lost that momentum. So the same way I think um, Julian Alfred will galvanize that kind of momentum among our young people and especially young girls too. Well, the question I'm really asking here is, um, are we looking to have plans? Because you mentioned Walcott, and Walcott was in the artistic community. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling that uh, Walcott was seen by the successive government as a one-off, that this thing will not happen again. <coughs> the, um, mm -hmm. And so the investment from government and from the, uh, the, the private sector did not reflect any confidence in anyone else in the island to achieve that or to even come close. Mm -hmm. We are in a situation where, are, are we going to be in a situation where we're going to elevate Julian Alfred to this Walcott-like status without doing the investment that gives us a hundred more Julian Alfreds, the way we did not get a hundred more Derek Walcotts? Yes, but I'm saying, I think if we made some mistakes in the past, it is an opportunity for us to learn from that mistake and then see how we are going to invest in our young people so that they can follow suit from Julian Alfred. And as you know, the government has invested in Julian Alfred, not just because she's winner now, and I don't know if I'm privy to announce what I know the government has put in to support her to reach where she is. And it's not just the little 150 that was sent to her in Jamaica. So I know if it is a, a, a statement that has to be made public, I don't want to be the first to say it, but I'm aware that they have put in quite a bit of resources. Then we have the local business, like um, First National Bank has been supporting her all along the way. So now it is even more necessary that we have a planned action and not spontaneous events on how we are going to use that energy to help other people to rally around that movement. We have to make it a movement for our young people and don't let it be a one-off and that's it. We have Naomi London that is already following suit and there are many others that are coming. So we have to create that path. It may be a trail for, for us to follow. And our young men, we want to find activities to energize our young men. And if you notice, I mean, I always lament the fact that um, having been responsible for home affairs um, in the last two and a half years, that I was, with, I was minister with home affairs under my portfolio, that um, bodily, Correctional facility has 580 something inmates, and about 14 of them are women. So, why our boys are spending so much of their energy? There are a few young men, but majority of them are young people, all the time behind bars. We have to find something else for them to do so that they can use their time and be very productive in the country. So I, I want to use Julian Alfred as the stepping stone to bring both men and women into a new direction. I think it can happen, and I think the government has what it takes and the commitment to drive that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, okay. um, On your constituency now, at the, at the launch of the Talvin Housing Development, you announced that there were plans to create um, a Babono village or town, as you put it. Um, could you provide more information on what that could mean or what that could look like? Okay, well, um, it is said that Babono has all the facilities that a town or a village has. There are one or two few, few little things we are missing, and I believe that um, the time is right for us to upgrade that community to a town or a village. We have been in consultation with the Minister of Local Government and Housing, and they are, <clears throat> they are actually coining, they are actually coining the, the concept. And for those who are familiar with Babono, they would not realize that there is an area in Babono called Babono Central, and it's actually a crisscross road that takes you to north, south, east, and west. And this is where Babono actually started. The first school, the first church, the first everything started in that area. And now we are going to put all the facilities and the amenities around to define it as a little town for the people in Babolo. 
So one of the major projects that we will undertake there will be the the ref we have to re design the Barbono Multipurpose Center that will almost become an administrative, government administrative building. So it is not just a place where you just have shows and activity. There will be government offices and government services. We have to bring in banking facilities. We have to bring shops and stores and supermarkets right there. And we are going to develop our bus terminals where people will be dropping off from there and then take shuttle into the wider community. Babono has about 18 small communities. And that is a wide constituency to serve. And this town will definitely bring life. The other thing that will contribute to the town is the north-south bound traffic. Many people get stuck up on the highway having pa to pass through town. But now they are fixing the road from Babono to Grozily. And once they fix that road, then there will be free flow of traffic from north to south. You don't have to go through the highway. You don't have to go through castries if you are going to the mall and you are going to the airport or you are going to the south of the island. So that Babono will be that freeway for traffic to flow in that, in that direction. So I'm looking forward to that big, big plan. And the Talvan land is one where... We were fortunate that um, through the PROUD program, we were able to give the persons who actually lived on the property, some of them have lived there for over 30 years, government was able to award the land to them at $2.50 a square foot. And that land after development by the new developer now will go at $14.50 a square foot. So that is a huge savings for the residents in in, in, um, in Talvan. There were 73 lots up for sale and from information reaching me, all are sold already. And we are hoping that we can put two of the high-rise buildings that the Ministry of Housing is planning to do in the Beauceju area in Grosile. We will try and put two of these in that development there. So, and this development is just about two minutes drive from Babolo Central. So we are going to combine these two to bring that central activity into Babolo. So, mm -hmm. so what, what location exactly would, you say there are four roads? Yeah, so, when you reach the junction in Babolo, yeah. by the Malipopa Center, you drive from Castries, so that's the west. And if you go straight, you find yourself into Fonasso, that will take you into Debara and Grantans. If you swing left, you will go north, which takes you to Lakwa. It can take you to Gara, Bogis, and right into Grozile or back into Grand Rivier. And if you swing right, it takes you to um, Kakojiwa, back to the Mon Castries, and then to Viewfort. So, that, so area. that area there, right. We are trying to create a roundabout there that takes you to any direction you want. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. You have a red <laughs> jumper. I, 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 I knew that was good. It made me happy. And I, and I may see a red thing happen. <laughs> yes, today is Julian Alfred. I have to have my national color, you know what I mean? And, and the color of the flag is gold, not yellow. Yeah. Uh, gold. The flag. You want to get it right. The color of the flag is gold. Let's get the colors right. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, good morning. I guess you all are, have joined in the celebration of the achievements of Julian Alfred. Um, <clears throat> I must tell you, it's really one of the proudest days of, of my life. I'm, I'm very proud of what Julian has done. Julian has um, reached the pinnacle of performance as far as athletics is concerned, as you know, the 100 meter race is one is the most prestigious race in the Olympics. I do not intend to, to, to seek or to claim any credit. I think the credit goes to Julian Alfred, who has been persistent, who has had the discipline, who has had the, the, the commitment to um, do what she did and become a world champion. So in terms of looking for credit, don't expect me to claim any credit. I will not. 
Um, I also want to tell you that we think that Julian should be afforded the highest level of recognition possible. There's going to be a public holiday, which I'll announce at some point, and the cabinet will meet on the appropriate recognition for Ms. Alfred. But I can tell you, the government and people of the government is very proud, and we think we should use Ms. Alfred as a, a model, what discipline, what commitment, what hard work can do. And understand that products of St. Lucia can do well. She started in St. Lucia, she, she continued in Jamaica, so products of the region, real products of the region can do very well. Um, Miss Alfred started in, in Cicero, then she moved over to St. Catherine School in Jamaica, and then she went, went to Texas where she applied her trade. So she, is, she should be a symbol of commitment, of discipline, of being able to stay focused of looking at the cup half full instead of always half empty, of not allowing negativity and envy to confuse you and stay focused. That's what she should she is. And that's what makes me even happier. That somebody from Cicero can reach these heights. <laughs> Commitment, hard work, dedication. So we're very proud of her. Okay, so but we've seen that Sinusha now has the potential to create. And also, be, before that, so I'm sorry. I also want to recognize all the other people who took part in the in the Olympics. All of them, from the sailor to the 400 meter to the other body to to the the, the swimmer. All of those. I want to tell them they they made us proud. They they did not medal, but they made us proud. I'm very proud of them. All of those who took part and the organizers, the people. In the athletics, in the in the Olympic Olympics Association, the committee, everybody, Twatine, uh, again, a local coach. He started this whole thing. We have to recognize him from Saint Lucia. From Saint Lucia, started in, in, in started in Conway, and look and look at and he could nurture her because the, there were times when she was feeling despondent, and then she. Raised herself, yes, and she raised herself. So many people have to get, have to be complimented for this. So don't expect me to get in, into the, in, into the, into the, um, thing about who who gave what, who gave this. We passed that stage. She's world class. She's at, at the top of her game. We're gonna keep her there. We're looking forward for her to win the 200 meter meter race. Looking forward for her to to, to get gold there also. Yes. Okay, so yes, um, we have the potential to create um, world-class athletes. What is your administration going to do to ensure that in, let's say, by the next time we have Olympics, we can produce a few more Julian Alfreds across the sporting um, arena? I'm sorry you caused me to have to answer you. Um. I would have preferred not to answer you, but I have to because you asked me the question. <laughs> we went to Parliament and we borrowed $80 million. $80 million ostensibly for Cricket World Cup and to improve facilities for the island. We were condemned by the opposition. Letters were written to the IMF and to the World Bank to castigate us, to speak about how we were irresponsible. Now you brought it up, but you brought it up, I have to answer you. That money would have been used to upgrade the Darren Sami Cricket Ground to make it a world class, to, to, to ensure it's a world class, for, for, uh, a world class facility that brought uh, thousands of tourists into the country for the World Cup. That will attract even more people for the CPL. And the rest of the money is going to be put in facilities. You started by the, by the, in the Mindo Phillip Park. In the Mindo Phillip Park, you'll see tremendous work has happened on the Mindo Phillip Park. Then the work go happening in the Marshall grounds. Then we're going to move, then we did work in Grosley. Every facility in the country is going to be enhanced because one of the biggest issues related to sports is facilities. This is why we borrowed eighty million dollars. That was an investment in sports. That was an investment in the young people of this country. We thought it was necessary that we could we could invest it because we had faith and confidence in them. When we borrowed the 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 80, 80 million dollars, 
You understand? But all sorts of of of, of short sighted short sighted comments were, were made because we were putting politics before the young people of the country. We were putting politics before sports. We were putting our survival as politicians before sports. But I'm pleased that you asked me this question about facilities. Because you can't improve facilities, you can't improve facilities without money. You can't improve facilities without money. And this is why we have the same professional football league, where we are having 17 teams at different levels. At one level, they're going to get paid a stipend to play football, developing the holistic footballer. Having have, he has to have some discipline, he has to have some academics to get to where he is. This is why we have the elite program, the elite athletes, the elite sports program, where there is a desk in the Ministry of, 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 of Sports to ensure, again, that we get sportsmen, we, we, we can nurture them from the, the, the start. This is why we have, we have the youth economy that could give finance to sports people when they start to get their gears and to get the, the equipment. So it's, it's a holistic situation as far as young people and sports are concerned. Um, yes, sir. Are you finish? Yes. yes, sir. Um, we've heard the saying that, you know, beyond every dark cloud is a silver lining. And you've always, you know, um, compared Ju Julian to a beacon of hope. You know, now that she's reached that pinnacle in her in success, do you see you know, do you see her being emulated? You know, that, that is something that young people want to aspire to. You mentioned the youth economy, but she's also like a ray of light to the younger people because despite all the tremors and all the disgruntlement, someone has risen up to take the country to a higher stage. I mean, is it something that, you know, we really would to aspire to, for young people to emulate? Exactly, and this is why we must assist her. We must assist her with positivity. We must assist her with less negativity. We must assist the young people with being more positive, looking at the glass half full most of the time. Too many times for our own selfish reasons, we spread propaganda, misinformation, and untruths for our own selfish political reasons. That's why we must look at it. We must look at the glass half full all the time. We must encourage young, young people. We must encourage them. We, we, must, we must find ways and means where we can assist them. We can assist them in a situation where they can find a wolf and not be confused with propaganda and misinformation. And this is why I've represented a constituency for 1997. I have never, never put sports and politics. Never. And I, I'm on, can be on the record. I never win my elections for playing games with sports people and young people. Never. You understand? So, because I believe that young people and sports are too important for us to. I can, I can give you stories about what I've done for sports people in this country. Stories, reams of stories, reams of stories. What I do and what I continue to, what I continue to do. Sometimes I don't even go to, to the tournaments. I don't even attend. Because I believe that young people should be allowed to be young. They should be allowed to make up their own minds. And I've reaped the benefits of that. I mean, there are people in this room, can bend their head down now, who have benefited from sports, in, in, from sports initiatives in, in, in my constituency. You, you understand all the time. So my history is clear. So all the propaganda, the lies, and the misinformation, it, it doesn't go anywhere because the people know. So when it comes to youth and sports, they know where I'm coming from. So when I see people go on the radio and see that they had things in my constituency I didn't get involved, I ignore it. Because, because that's cheap politics. Cheap. I ignore it. Because the young people know. Up to yesterday, we had... A, 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 a donation of dozens of sporting gear, of football gear to the young people of, of, of my constituency. I didn't know, I don't know who they gave it to. I don't know how they divided it. All I did, I made it available and the Marsha Football League did, did, did the rest. This is how I operate. This is how I operate. So 
I agree with you. We must take sports as an, an indication of how we can reach the highest heights if we have commitment, discipline, and principles. Yes, but emphasis will be placed on the, the school curriculum. You would we revisit the school curriculum. We have to again, make again, things that emphasis. things that we haven't publicized. We have to have a junior a schools sports football, um, football competition, not competition, a football, not only a tournament, a training program done by Coach Charles and Coach and Coach um, Jean happening now. In fact, last year, I sponsored one in my constituency. Nobody knew. I didn't go in front of the television and, and, and advertise it. I, I funded it. Entire sports program for the young people in, 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 in my constituency. You, you understand? You know, I, we've built, we built a, a, a playing facility in, in Pave when I was ridiculed. You understand? Unfortunately. And this is why. I made a point that when facilities are built for the people of this country, anybody, there's absolutely no compromise when these things get damaged. And, and, and I want to tell you that we're going to be renovating the James Belgrave Court, and we're also going to be building a steel pan to bring back steel band, to bring back the Diamond Steel Orchestra in, in the constituency. That's going to be happening momentarily, anytime now. I'm happy you spoke about facilities. Um, I think it's certainly a shame that a country who has now produced a Olympic champion um, does not have a well a world class, I could say, athletic stadium. Could we see the, the what is now the George? Well, I guess technically the George Orlam Stadium return to its glory before um, your term. I tell, you I tell you something. I, I, I don't want to boast. 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 When we negotiated the Saudi loan and we put in a vulnerability clause in there, it was to compete St. Jude and to do some work on St. Jude's. You remember the you and cry that you reported Went about this money, say how I can spend 1.5 million. You remember what you, you, what you reported? I never answered because I knew, you know, I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something. The problem with some people is they forget the history. They've forgotten their history. Look at the governments that have done, that have promoted playing facilities in this country. Think about it. Darren Sammy Grant, we got lambes for it. There was an Australian, and you young journalists, I really appreciate you all, but I think you should look at the history. So when politicians, make the, politicians and the surrogates make statements, you could double check it. Who built the Darren Sammy Grant? You know how we got castigated for the Darren Sammy Grant? Because there was supposed to be an Australian tour coming, and we had to say they couldn't come. I got cast. They said I was I was in problems with Mario Michel because of that. You you know this is that this is the history you don't know. The Labour Party, and I don't want to say that this morning, but you forced me to say it. <laughs> the Labour Party is the one that built the Dan Sammy Cricket Ground. The Labour Party is the one who built you call the George Odlam Stadium. The Labour Party. We are the ones who did work in the. Philip Masterground in Viewfort, the stadium in Souffre. You must the history. So we haven't got to, to run in a run away and see that this is me. What we're doing for sports and things. So our history, the Labour Party's history on sports, and our history on young people. It's clear. We were the party of universal secondary school education. We are the party of universal primary school education. Again, there's a history that we've forgotten. We were the party for it. Of course, it hadn't been perfect. Of course, but we were the party. When we built a dim at school, the dim at school that caused children not to go to school for a half day. Are you aware that children in Indonesia went to school for half, half, half a day? A shift system. The Labour Party is the one that abolished it. 
The Labour Party is the one that caused universal secondary education. When we are castigated and criticized, all we said, let the children get at least the basic education and youth. And we are the party who are going to create TVET, technical vocation education, with the with the commissioning of four TVET schools. We are the party that's doing that. We are the party. These are facts. These are not things I'm imagining. These are, things I'm not, these are not things I'm saying without any figures. You know, sometimes people just say things. No figures. Oh, this happened. No historical underpinning. No saying it happened at that time. Just say it. But I'm giving you facts, which I always ask you to fact check me. I always ask you that, you know, fact check me. I'm not getting involved in emotion and, and just saying things, Trump-wise. Trump I don't do that. I say things that you can prove. So when you go into all these emotional, ter in the, the, these emotional things and just saying things without any basis, look at the economy of this country. We've had three years of growth. Three years of growth. That's a fact. Unemployment has never been low in this. That's a fact. Right now, now and right now, you see people begin to question figures. Suddenly, we begin to question figures. All in a sudden. So the World Bank is wrong, the IMF is wrong, the ECCB is wrong. I won't even tell you what the ECCB is predicting for St. Lucia's economic growth this year. Fact. Not me. So I want, you, I want you to understand that you have to, we cannot deal with things from an emotional point of view. We have to deal with things from a factual point of view. And the facts show, and the figures show, the figures show, that this country, this country, is doing better than it has done for a long, long time. Unemployment has never been as low as it is now. Fact. That doesn't mean everybody's working. It doesn't mean that. But the fact is, unemployment has never been as low as it has been for the decade. That's a fact. But, well, Mr. Prime Minister, I don't think you answered my question, what my original question. My original question was, um, will this administration return the George Orgeant? I just to told you that we, we borrowed money right, from but, the Saudis but will it be to finished? complete St. Jude. But will it be finished? I can't tell you. I'm okay. not an engineer. All right, although although you all get annoyed by I'm not an engineer. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> what I'm asking is that we are going to use the rest of, of the money to complete St. Jude. Okay, right? But it's the government. And that is why. And that is the when you compete St. Jude's with the CDM. And that is why I told you, that's why the $1.5 million was put in the budget to begin preliminary work on St. Jude, okay, fair. which was criticized. Fair, fair enough. On the, on the stadium, sorry, on the stadium. Fair. Which was criticized. Perhaps you can answer the question for us about how St. Jude's uh, restoration is going. Going very well. And when we can see an opening of some kind. You see, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. When I say... When I say things, you see, let me tell you my problem. My problem is that I can't tell you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, you know, you don't want to say that. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a contractor. I have to wait. There are serious problems. There are supplies. There are supply chain issues. Supply, supply chain issues. Serious supply chain issues, you know. And again, you know, they want you to believe that St. Lucia is just a, a little part of the world, and Pierre and the government government. This morning, the U.S. stock market has, has one of its largest slumps in history. Some of the Dow Jones went down by 839 points. I guess I caused that, right? <laughs> I guess I'm the one to cause it. Now, there are serious supply chain issues. The, coming through the Panama Canal, we have problems. The Chinese threat, Chinese threat, has gone up substantially. We have a looming war between Israel and is left the Palestinians now is gone now to Lebanon and 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 Iran. Iran. That's what we're facing. But we stay here and we just say things. So the reason why I can't tell you about that because there is supply chain issues. Things are ordered from abroad, and they may not come at the appropriate time. Will we still get the opening of St. Jude's before the next election? 
all things being equal, that is the intention. Um, on the matter of hospitals, um, the SLMDA yes, the SLMDA wrote, wrote a letter which I wish it. I'm going to meet them this afternoon on Tuesday to 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 discuss the the, the, the the letter. I've said before, I want no conflict with any doctor or any nurse or any health worker. The SLMDA have they've had concerns before. These concerns are not new. We understand it. We empathize with them, and we're going to meet them to see if you can have an approach to alleviate these circumstances. The first issue was the emergency emergency services at the hospital. I met with them, and we decided that we're going to immediately look for some more space for the emergency ward, immediately. That work is supposed to start any time now. I empathize with the nurses and the doctors. I understand their, 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 their concerns. So I want to show you, Ms. Romulus, that we're going to meet with them, Tomorrow, and I'm going to use the government's best. We used to use the government's best efforts to alleviate the condition. But we understand what what we say, and we understand what they say, and we want to alleviate the condition. But we want to work together with them. Um, so, what are your thoughts on your, your cabinet minister's um, statement at the SLP Youth um, AGM? My who? Cabinet minister, who Mr. Frederick. Uh -huh. Who I think he insinuated that the SLMD president um, wrote the letter because I guess she's acting on behalf of the opposition. Um, your thoughts on that? Because well, you know, I tell you something. We've got so sensitive these days when it comes. We got very sensitive. The amount of things that the opposition says, you haven't even heard the amount of the, the, the level of misinformation, lies, calumny. What? I heard, I don't condone what the minister said. I don't condone it. And, I, and if I have to call him out, I'll call him out. I am never one that will allow any of my ministers to say what the opposition says. Never. What I'm saying to you is if the minister said that, if the minister implies that, I think the, 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 the minister should not have implied it. And if he did, I want to tell you, I will. I believe he should not have said it, right? If he, if he, if that's what he meant, if that's how you interpreted what, what, what he meant. No, he's, well, that's what he insinuated, and, uh, and he said that he had the documents and whatever, and he would um, bring it out on his show. So, well, again, I, as I'm saying to you, if the minister implied that it was political, I don't agree with him. I don't think it was political. I don't agree with him. I don't give him, and I'm going to call out after. I've done it before. I've done it before, you know. I'm not condoning things, everything, you know. I always ask for proof. I don't allow anybody, you know, because there's a thing. In this world of misinformation and AI, people say and do whatever. I don't allow myself to be carried away when one person says something, you know, because I always want proof, you understand? So if you say so, the minister says so. I think you should not say it, and it's a statement that probably was a little, was, you see, was a little um, too emotional. We must understand that the minister himself has been under tremendous attack from, from, I mean, because, you know, let me tell you what I find strange. The opposition can say whatever they want. The opposition says whatever they want. I don't listen to opposition radio. When people tell me, what the opposition says. I wonder, are we living an alternative reality? Right? But nobody seems to call them out. Nobody seems to call them out. The most misinformation and downright untruths are being said every day. Some of it was said this morning in a way that I couldn't believe I was living in, in the same country. You understand? But nobody calls them out. But I, as Prime Minister of the country, want to unite this country, <clears throat> want people of this country to have one purpose, the development of our country. That's my only purpose, to my sister Lucia, to do better, for us to produce more Julian Alfreds. On the way to that, we need everyone to come together. So if that's it was done, I think it should not be done. It should not be said. 
Você não já assina a uh, uh, tremendous spike in Google Trends? Um, I think we are the second most on Google Trends. Um, I think we are the second most search. So, so second most search. Yeah, second most search country. Oh, mm-hmm. Yes, um, online. Um, I think outside of the US, following Julian Alfred's victory. How can we use this opportunity um, to promote sports tourism in St. Lucia in particular? Um, how can we use, utilize you know, these opportunities to promote St. Lucia as a destination? Yeah. You see, again, you see me back. The World Cup was, mm-hmm. was the beginning. Right. Do you know that there was a, there was a 10 over us double weekend competition in St. Lucia? You remember that? Probably you used to be at school. Yeah, sports tourism. There's a double weekend competition where we got, um, I think, Fred Flint was there, et cetera, where we hit yeah. Mr. Lawrence supposed to do that, where we started. But that's, again, that's the value. And this is why we repaired the stadium. That's why we repaired the Darren Sammy grounds. That's why we repaired it. So our facilities for that to happen. The, the Ministry of Tourism will have to have a plan to see how we can ensure that what that the the, the 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 searches and the interest in Saint Lucia is followed up. Um, the last time <coughs> the last time you met at Parliament, I think you made mention of an athlete who would have wanted to compete for Saint Lucia. Yes, Lawrence, Miss yes. Lawrence, she got the passport, uh-huh. but I have to find out what really happened. So, do you think um, moving forward there'd be more of these again? Things I even forgot that the food generation. The first generation passports, first generation citizenship is something I forgot. Another way we can encourage athletes who are born in the in in, in the diaspora to work to run for Saint Lucia. That's an, another another way that we try to enhance our athletics, our sports people. <clears throat> yes. Um, congratulations on getting more than eighty million dollars worth of publicity for this island based on her on her. Uh, it's a lot of money. It will be a lot of money. Taken, There's you. a lot of uh, St. Lucia is in the global news now because of this. So that it points to the fact that Alfred's win is not it's not just sports. It's a really a good piece of business. How do we turn that into opening doors for investment, export, not just tourism on sports tourism, but Investment and export. How do we capitalize on the ad- attention the world is showering us with? And two more follow-ups, if I could just put them out right now so that we go past them. Um, will this have a dramatic effect on investment in sports training, not just facilities, but training for Lucian athletes? And how do we turn this win into a weapon in the struggle against violent crime? Okay. Very, very good. Very good set of uh, questions. You know, the, the, the Julian Alfred victory, or achievement, right, has almost unbound, boundless. The word that comes from after that is boundless. It has unleashed and usually. And we have to, we have to, to collectively, collectively, yeah? you know, when I say collectively, I mean collectively. Collectively, we have to pay together. This is why I have not come in this morning and said, we give this money, I give this, I give now. Nah. Collectively, we have to get together. I know what you you you, you last me something about somebody said so. Again, that was I know that was your last me. You know, I mean this is a, I did, let me tell let me tell you the, the, the problem they have with me. I anticipate them. You know? <laughs> I understand because I've been around, I've been around, I've been around. I understand these things. I, mean, I know the history. And this is why you see I can deal with the history. You know? All the players, all the players, I know them, I know the history. And that is and I'm a student of history. I have to read some, some a bit and I've been there. So that's why I don't answer them to many things, you know, because I know the backstory. I always know the backstory of these things. I know what you ask me. <laughs> Again, that was, you know, that was euphoria. And, you know, you must understand that politicians are human beings, you know. One man, one guy said, this is a war. You understand? I, I don't know, but he said it. You understand? And, and another guy said, if you burst the prime minister's head, he, he understands that. So, yes, I don't know. You want to hear the tip? Yeah, if you bust the prime minister's head, drink it, make him drink his blood. 
That's be good when he travels. That, that was said on public radio, and the and the host said, "I understand." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. He said so. You you, you understand. So <clears throat> these things happen. Uh, euphoric moments. People are are, are are happy. People so they say that again. It, should not, it may not have been said at the right time, but you know what you're going to ask me. It is something that you know what I But again, the same way. You see, you, you're surprised at the audience. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing because you're surprised you know what, what, what I'd ask you. I know what you want to ask me. Oh, can it I sh ask should not have been said. Don't no, ask it because I answer it. Really. No, 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 it's not that. I actually wanted to know if um, the CIP ministers, PMs, had had, the, had an engagement on the sidelines of the CARICOM no. government. Did you all speak? No, 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 no. I tell you something. <clears throat> you talk about yes. CI, CIP. Yes. Which country? Tell me something. Go back in and do your thing. Tell me what international body has questioned St. Lucia CIP? Which one? Just tell me one. Tell me what St. Lucian passport that has been identified as being anything you want. Just one. Who? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, so I'm, I'm not getting involved in, in, in it. All I'm saying is that no international body, no international body, no international body, it might happen this afternoon. But as I speak, there's not been one international body that has questioned and Russia CIP. Not one. Not one. And yet the name of the country is being slandered and the government is not taking actual action against the people slandering the name of the country. Some people think so. But you know, um, it's something called patience and truth. If you take somebody to court, supposing you, Jason, take somebody to court, and you have all the evidence, what, what do you do? And you wait. That's what I want to say. I'm, I'm saying nothing else. I'm saying nothing else. If you have all the evidence in the world, things are so black and white. And, and I'm not talking about CIP, I'm not talking about anything else. I'm saying to you, if you take somebody to court and you have evidence that is so clear that a six year old child can see, all you do, you sit back and you wait. You sit back and you wait. There's no need to campaign. There's no need to. You just sit back and you wait and you see your time is coming. That's all. And I'm talking about life generally. Once the facts are on your side, you sit back and you wait. <laughs> Go ahead. You said, you said campaign. Is your, is your party gearing up for elections? Boy, from me, start gearing up for elections from since the 20, 23rd of July. Would you, would you say that the campaigning season <laughs> has commenced? No, no, no. We, this is mean, this, that, we're just going to run the election on our record, you know. A record. The election is based on our record. That's all. Our record. Our record in the economy, our record on unemployment, our record. Our record. That's all. Right? right? Okay, okay, but <clears throat> more serious things. When can we see the commencement of CIP funded projects? Because um, you've, there are announcements about the, the CIP funded housing and so on. When can we see something starting? The, the Rock Hall housing, housing, the Rock Hall housing project is at the DCA now. What's there is the plumbing aspect because you know they have to do the, 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 the they have to have special um, plumbing because they can't join it into the government sewer because of the way it is. So they have to have a whole set of, of plumbing issues for waste disposal and things. So that's in that's going to go to planning very soon. The Rockall project. And I think, I hope, that comes to the planning process and we, we could start. I don't have to give dates because you 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 lose it against me. It, it'll start at the soonest. Okay? But it's one. Then the road project, you saw the sign on the Shosi Road. There's essentially the Central the the Infrastructure Project that hasn't started because there were some insurance issues. You see, a lot of these, these, these jobs, these things, they are 
unforeseen circumstances that had happened. So the Chaussee project hadn't started because of some insurance situation as far as the Chaussee project is, is, con is concerned. So you will see that you will see that starting very, very shortly. Um, the road projects, they are lined up, and but the show will start, we're going to start on the show, see. We're going to start on the show, see, and we're going to start in, in, in Rock Hall. Speaking of roads and patients, motoring public has been patient, especially concerning Cullis Sack. Hopefully it pleases you at least that the roundabout is finally open and that Jica Bridge is finally being utilized. <coughs> yes, that's, that's, yeah, that is okay. some good news. Yeah. That's some good news. And the work, since the, my intervention um, and the pressure, the work is continuing. But we are also doing work on the other stage, the other lot. You know, the retaining walls have been built. And then we found that we're going to be short of money to complete it. So we have to go to borrow $10 million to complete the second and third lots. So we've started that process. Hopefully it can be smooth sailing from there on. Okay, thank you very much, you and continue. Right my but we'll do next time. And let's continue Julian to Alfred celebrate is. Julian Alfred, and let's look to see what can happen tomorrow. If it can be another goal, so you can have two gold, two gold medals, two Nobel laureates. Two Peters. See you.